Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the fourth and final Sunday of the Blessed Month of Tuba. And we read a familiar passage. This passage is actually going to be read also in, the, in Great Lent. The story today is remarkable. Uh, not only because it deals with a man who is physically born blind but, and who receives his sight, but I think the real, the, real, the real special part of this passage is that it clearly deals with the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees, right? These who are supposed to be the leaders of the Jewish people, the people who were supposed to know God. Surely these men would recognize the work of God when they saw it, Surely they would bow their knees and honor the one capable of such great miracles. Surely they would recognize that of all their hopes and all their dreams in a Messiah would be fulfilled in this Jesus of Nazareth. But we notice something tragic happens. They could not see. They could not see the Lord Jesus for who he was. They refused to see him as he was. Rather, they preferred to see him through their sinful ways. So why did they not recognize him? It's because they chose to trust in themselves, chose to trust in their own righteousness, not in the Lord. In our society, this is what happens with our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a warning for all of us. In our day and age, everyone you meet has an opinion on our Lord Jesus Christ. And usually, those opinions are tainted. They are deeply affected by whether or not we're trying to live a life of holiness and purity. Our opinions are also affected by whether we are prepared to be corrected. When, when I meet people who have a problem with Christianity, because a lot of conversations happen when you wear what I wear, oftentimes I see people who refuse to be corrected. I see people who refuse to be held accountable. I see people who refuse to be taught by our Lord Jesus Christ. I see people who would rather change who they worship than change who they are and how they behave. Being a faithful Christian is harder and more demanding because Christ demands the ultimate. He demands our heart. And this is what I see in this example of the Pharisees in this passage. No matter what they see, no matter how many questions they ask, no matter if they hear personal testimony, no matter whether they uh, question direct witnesses to the miraculous events, nothing will change the perception of Jesus Christ. In the Psalms, Psalm 18, it says, uh, With the pure, you you show yourself pure, but with the perverse, you appear to be perverse. It's because the Pharisees were impure that Christ appeared impure to them. And ultimately, because the blind man was pure, that he could recognize Christ as the pure one, the Messiah. So, I should reflect. That's the point of these passages. I should reflect in my personal life. What are my thoughts of Christ? And what do my thoughts about Christ actually say about me? Another point for today. Another point is how we look at difficulties and tragedies in our life. The disciples saw the tragedy of the man born blind, and they wanted to know only one thing. Who's to blame? Whose fault is this? This man was born blind. Who is to blame, his parents or him? But our Lord offers us another way, a better way to deal with tragedy and difficulties in our life. In essence, he tells the disciples, don't try to blame anyone. Don't try to blame anyone for the bad thing that has happened. Instead, recognize that this is a chance to witness God's work. And this is true. Would we recognize and give glory to God if life was always smooth sailing? I doubt it. I don't think so. When things become difficult, when we're faced with tragedy and difficulties, when life becomes too much to bear, 
and we're forced to bend our knee and to be humbled, we find that God oftentimes provides a way. And he prepares our hearts to receive it. It may take some time, though. Sometimes we're in the middle of that chaos, and it's really hard to find our way. But it takes time. We spend so much time blaming others when things go wrong. And the Lord is asking us to rise above all that. He wants us to see that whatever difficulties arise, whatever tragedies and circumstances may come our way, he's allowed it. And he can resolve it in his timing. They wanted to blame sin. They wanted to blame the blind man. They wanted to blame his parents. But the Lord, our our Lord Jesus Christ, refused to put blame on them. And replying the way that he did, our Lord corrects our misguided thinking. God didn't do this as a punishment. Just because somebody gets sick, just because somebody or something terrible happens to someone, it doesn't mean that is karma. We don't believe in that. The martyrs of the Christian church in history died horrible deaths. And it's not because of anything they had done to deserve it. It was to glorify God is to glorify God, who was put to death in the same manner. God wasn't punishing them. That's not the God who is love. That's not who we worship. God hadn't punished this man. What kind of God would we worship if he acted this way? Oftentimes, we meet people outside the church who have a problem with God, and they say, how could you worship a God that does this and this? You're right. I wouldn't worship the same God either. That's not my God that you describe me. That's not the God that I I worship. The Lord said to the disciples that this was allowed by God so that his wonderful work could be made manifest in the life of this poor blind man. I wonder if we would ever think this way when we are faced with these difficult situations and trials. How many of us would say to ourselves, this is a chance for the work of God to be manifest in my life? When we see the world in that way, it means that we have God-given eyes. We have eyes to truly see reality, and our blindness is taken away from us, and it's replaced with a very clear and true sight. Oftentimes, we can get stuck in our negative ways. We can be so focused on what we don't see happening in our lives. We can be so focused on what we don't have. And we refuse to see what the Lord is actually doing. And how he has generously provided for us. So, unfortunately, we can get stuck in this way of thinking. So some advice, this is for me, not for you. Not to spend our lives looking for people or things to blame for everything that is wrong and difficult and inconvenient and uncomfortable. Blame doesn't make anything better. Actually, if anything, the Desert Fathers tell us to blame only ourselves. St. Anthony said to St. Abhavimin, Our great work is to lay the blame for our sins upon ourselves before God and to expect to be tempted to our last breath. Don't use every difficulty in life as an excuse to become a judge of others. Instead, when we see these difficult situations in our lives, it's a chance to look at our own shortcomings and to give the entire situation to the feet of Christ. We do this when we come to the Lord with a heartfelt prayer from the depths of our being. We say to the Lord, Lord, you see the situation. Only you can resolve it. Only you could provide healing. This is our reality. 
Until we see this, I'm afraid we are truly blind. But when we finally begin to put trust in Christ, we begin to see his work through every difficulty. We may even find a way to thank God for all that he has allowed to happen in our lives. Can you imagine? We may see that our difficulties were gifts that helped us grow, that formed us, and to, allowed us to trust God more deeply in our lives. There are no limits to what God can do in our lives. We put limits on God. Never forget that even the worst situation known to man, its death, looks insignificant in the light of what God has done for us. We are his children. What the Lord conquered in his resurrection, he freely shares it with each one of us. This is our belief. This theme of blindness and sight points to the idea of faith and belief. Faith and belief versus unbelief. For the Pharisees, it was easy to see that Jesus had broken the Sabbath through very narrow human terms. But it was not easy for them to see that the miracle that he had prepared that he performed in front of them from their very eyes and their hearts. They questioned the man. They questioned the parents. They questioned this man again. None of the answers that were given to them were good enough. And they refused to accept any idea or thought that was out of line with their preconceived notions and expectations. In verse 27 of today's gospel, it said, He answered them, I told you already, and, and you did not listen. Why did you want to hear it again? Do you also want to be one of his disciples? And then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. The Pharisees began to turn hostile towards this man. Do you want to be made his disciples? The Pharisees were very upset with that. You are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. And that's a sad statement. That's a sad statement. It's not that Moses was bad. Like Moses is such a great prophet. But one cannot compare the created to the creator. The statement by the Pharisees reminds us in the gospel reading that we read from uh, the gospel of St. John chapter 1. And the passage ends with the following words. For the law came through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. What a verse. Also, interestingly enough, in Vespers last night, if you came to Vespers last night, you would have heard from John chapter 5. And at the end of that passage, it said, um, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father, for there is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed in Moses, you would have believed in me, for he wrote about me. The law came first, but it was meant to prepare us for the lawgiver himself. And that's the crux of the matter. For the Pharisees, the law was God. It was their salvation. It was understood in the narrowest of terms and always used as an opportunity to point fingers and to accuse and to blame others while excusing and justifying myself. Satan would be proud because he is the accuser. He accuses each one of us in our daily spiritual struggles. He whispers in our ears and he tells us that God could never love you. He tells us that we're wicked. We're wicked sinners. What terrible people we are. We have no hope. But that's not the reality. That's not what we believe. It's true that we are sinners, but there's more to the story. One of the Eastern Fathers says, What does the law do without grace except make people still more guilty? Why? Because the law knows how to obey, but does not know how to help. The law can point out sin, but it cannot take away sin from the people. What can take away sin and abolish it completely from our lives and from our existence? What can get rid of this darkness is light. And faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, 
And we welcome this light into our hearts and it sweeps away this darkness and this blindness in our lives. So to conclude, in the history of the world, there has never been a man born without eyes who was miraculously healed. And God did the impossible because he can create out of nothing. And if the Lord can create out of nothing, then most certainly he can create out of something. Even if that something seems like a terrible thing. Maybe that's a terrible situation in our lives. Maybe if that something is someone like a sinner like me. He can create out of that. This is the way of God's love. The God who does not blame us. The God who does not who goes out of his way to provide healing because he was merciful to the blind man and he's merciful to us. Tragedies and difficulties and complications happen because the world has fallen. Our Lord Jesus Christ heals and he restores because he has overcome every difficult thing in life, even death itself. May we have faith in this merciful God and his only begotten son. May we be granted healing of our own blindness. And I pray that we can rejoice with this blind man and say, I was once blind, but now I can see. And glory be to God forever. Amen.